morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center and this is the show for Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. And on this episode, I'm going to highlight some of the views of a founder that I rarely cite or really even talk about. That's the first Chief Justice of the United States, John Jay. And I think going through just a little bit of his history and some of his views through his quotes in his own words, I think that gives us a pretty good example of how far pretty much everyone today is from the original Constitution and the founding principles and the American Revolution. First of all, before getting to that, a quick hello and a huge thank you. Thank you so much for being here, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. I can't thank you enough. While we allow people, I started a little early today. I guess I'm getting ready a little faster here in my new place. Uh, but I, while we're allowing people another minute or so, to get notifications to join us on the mainstream live platforms. I want to say hi to everyone out in the live chat. There's Cheriton Farmer in Missouri, Clay Kent. Always good to see you. Same with Haji in Southeast Michigan, Israel in Colorado, Dixie Strong in Bama, Kato in uh, Kato ILMC, Missouri Liberty Report. Good to see you. White Bearded New and everyone else. I know I'm just kind of uh, blasting through this and I'm probably missing a few people. I should mention if you want to follow along with the stuff that I'm going to be mentioning in this episode, uh, you can find all the links in a show link section. I publish a blog post about one to two hours after the live stream is done over at our show homepage, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And that way you'll be able to follow along with the stuff that I'm talking about. I'm just scratching the surface and you can read stuff in context on your own time and then ask questions leave comments, send emails to team at 10th Amendment Center .com, et cetera. And of course, we have all the other platforms there, video, audio only, and even our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Hi to Lawrence Smith in West Virginia and everyone else. Uh, let's get right to this. And uh, I get what made me think of this as a topic. Well, from a blog post that we ran by Mike Meharry just a few hours ago this morning, it was today in history, on October 19th, 1789, that John Jay was sworn in as the first Chief Justice of the United States. And I was like, okay, well, let's go through some of the stuff that, his, that made up his views. Uh, Mike writes that at the time, the power and scope of the high court were minuscule. So were the power and scope of the general government as well. During Jay's, I guess, almost six years as Chief Justice, the Supreme Court heard only four cases. And I do want to get to a couple of those in a moment, the two big ones, and highlight those opinions from John Jay. But first, from Richard B. Morris over at AmericanHeritage.com. This is an old school article. But he points out that Jay was only 43 when he became Chief Justice, 43 years old, and his legal and judicial experience had been relatively limited. He had not practiced law since 1774, so many years, though he had served a very brief term thereafter as Chief Justice of New York during the Revolutionary years. When Washington notified him of his appointment, Jay was, in fact, still holding over as Secretary of State, now interim for Thomas Jefferson, who did not assume the post, until March of 1790. So for almost six months, Jay wore two different hats, and he did so throughout his time there as well. Uh, but Richard goes on, he says, as Chief Justice, Jay distinguished between his personal role and that of the court. He held strict views of the court's functions and denied the right of the other two branches of the government to assign it, quote, any duties but such as are properly judicial and performed in a judicial manner. He also declined, and this was part of it because they wanted to give him official, they wanted him to give official opinions of the court on constitutionality of something that wasn't even a case before them. So he said, no, 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 no. So he declined in his official capacity to render advisory opinions to the executive branch. Now, he did in his personal account. Uh, capacity did render or send some opinions on how to do things, policy and the like. Now, I wanted to highlight these two cases. And the first one is Chisholm versus Georgia. Georgia was busy that time. Uh, but in 1793, and Mike Meharry writes that this was the most significant case decided or opined during Jay's term. It was a four to one opinion. The court held that Article three, section two of the Constitution granted federal court jurisdiction if the citizen of one state sued 
another state. So a citizen living, for example, in South Carolina sues the state of Georgia and the Supreme Court held, well, yeah, you could do that. The federal courts would take the case. Now, according to Oye, which I think is, man, I forget what uh, what school, law school actually puts this info out, but they have a lot of great info on uh, overviews of many of these old cases as well. In effect, the court held that the Constitution abrogated the state's sovereign immunity and granted federal courts the affirmative power to hear disputes between private citizens and states. Thus, state conduct was subject to federal judicial review. And Justice Iredell was the only one who voted no on this. He thought, no way, you couldn't do this. He was the only dissenting opinion. This is from Wiki, a nice overview. His opinion ultimately became the law of the land. So four to one, the four saying yes, and that was supposedly the supreme law of the land at the time. Iredell's opinion was no, but the states, surprised by the decision of the Supreme Court, called for the 11th Amendment to the Constitution, which precludes a state from being sued in federal court without the state's consent in that situation. So this was a big case. And in response, I think we learn a little bit of how the people are supposed to respond to things. If they don't like how the Supreme Court takes an opinion, they can clarify through the through an amendment and basically nullify the Supreme Court's opinion. Or they could in more probably a faster way of just ignore it, treat it as an opinion and an opinion only. But anyways, that was the first major one. And then the second one was Georgia versus Brailsford the following year. And here Mike writes, the J court upheld jury instructions and in so of in doing so, affirmed jury nullification. Jury nullification is where the jury has the right and the moral duty to judge not just the facts of the case. Here's the law that's on the books. And did, under the facts of what happened, in your opinion, are they guilty or not guilty? But at the same time, they're supposed to judge the law as well. So if they think the law or the... the uh, uh, the prosecution would lead to an unjust outcome. They could say not guilty. If they think that the law is unconstitutional, they can say not guilty. You could vote to acquit. This is a very powerful tool. It's the last peaceful line of defense for people who have been caged by government, for example. But here's what Jay wrote. It may not be amiss here, gentlemen, to remind you of the good old rule that on questions of fact, it is the province of the jury. On questions of law, it is the province of the courts to decide. But it must be observed that by the same law which recognizes this reasonable distribution of jurisdiction, you have never, nevertheless a right to take upon yourselves to judge of both and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. You're not going to hear that from, a, from any federal court anywhere at any level, anytime ever again, at least in modern times, or at least currently. They just don't take this type of view. And I know some historians will say, oh, Jay, this is a unique situation. He wasn't really on board with jury nullification. I call bull on that. Uh, but even if he wasn't fully, clearly, he's telling at least in this scenario of this case, and I guess you can click through and read on that, uh, learn a little bit more about the case on your own time. But he's clearly taking the position here in this specific scenario that the jury has the right to judge the law itself and say not guilty if they think the law is not worthy of it. Here's another one. Now, I should mention that during the revolution, and just some highlights, he was a member of the New York Committee of Correspondence. He was a member of the state militia. He was a delegate to the First and Second Continental Congress. And here up on the screen here, this was an address to the people of Great Britain in 1774, September of 1774. I believe this is the First Continental Congress. And this was Jay and a number of other people. But this is about property rights. No power on earth has a right to take our property from us without our consent. No power on earth. You'd never hear a federal judge say something like that today. He was also a president of the Continental Congress 
for a year or so during the war, and he helped write the Olive Branch Petition. This was, you know, before the Declaration of Independence, it was urging the British government to reconcile. They wanted to get peace. They were offering an olive branch. But he eventually threw his support behind uh, the Declaration of Independence. But peace was very important to John Jay, and he was a great negotiator. Uh, He was uh, well-versed in the law, and he was good with working with people. So he, in 1782, went to Paris, where the negotiations to end the Revolutionary War would take place. And here in a letter to Oh, and here uh, from PBS, they say, noting his centrality in the talks with England, John Adams later praised him as, quote, of more importance than any of the rest of us, including himself and Benjamin Franklin, John Jay and Lawrence. John Jay, according to Adams, was the most important in those negotiations. And here he is in a letter to uh, Governor Livingston in July of 1783. Peace is an ongoing an ongoing issue that John Jay talks about, and it's very powerful stuff. He reminds us that we should remember that to be constantly prepared for war is the only way to have peace. In other words, just make sure that you are powerful enough and strong enough to frighten off anybody from attacking you. And I think the people of the several states also have to have that type of a view. It's not just the government being prepared for war. It is the people themselves. We're missing out, certainly, on the latter half today. You know, you can see a government, which is the largest military empire, largest military budget in world history, but the people themselves are not prepared uh, for war to be able to preserve peace against tyrants, foreign and domestic. I cover that a little bit more on the last episode on Monday. Now, just weeks after the Treaty of Paris was signed, of course, which he was so uh, influential in negotiating, here's a letter to Governor Morris, September 24th, 1783. While there are knaves and fools in the world, there will be wars in it. So as long as there's bad people and dumb people in the world, and we are literally surrounded by them all the time, all over the place, all around the globe, We shouldn't be surprised that there are wars. And that's exactly how we followed up. While there are knaves and fools in this world, there will be wars in it. And that nations should make war against nations is less surprising than their living in uninterrupted peace and harmony. So he was very happy about uh, the peace treaty, the Treaty of Paris with Great Britain, but he recognized that this type of thing would happen over and over, and maybe he was warning what uh, was going to follow up in the decades to come. Anyways, he carried this view forward to the ratification debates. We know he was one of the three authors. He didn't do nearly as much work. He only wrote a handful of papers, and the Federalist Papers didn't do nearly as much work as Hamilton and as James Madison. But here in some of the early ones, like, for example, Federalist Number 4, he said, "...it is too true, however disgraceful it may be to human nature." that nations in general will make war whenever they have a prospect of getting anything by it. And that's why the founders wanted to ensure, because the old revolutionaries lived through a government that had arbitrary power, they wanted to separate the power of declaring and basically changing the state of things from war to peace to one branch of government and the executive, which, as James Madison uh, opined, was the most prone to war— Uh, They wanted to make sure that the executive would not be able to make that decision. So Jay is pointing out, as a student of history as well, that nations would always do this. And monarchs, he pointed out as a follow-up, and I'm paraphrasing here, he basically said they'll even make war when it's not something to gain. They'll just do it out of thirst for power or glory for themselves. So you definitely don't want to have a single person making that kind of decision. Unfortunately, that's something that's been abandoned for many, many decades. And here in an enclosure, I guess he sent this off to George Washington. He, um, uh, this was in May of 1793. He said, until war is constitutionally declared, you have to have a declaration of war. The nation and all its members must observe and preserve peace and do the duties incident to a state of peace. So the first Chief Justice of the United States, here he is writing in his personal capacity and opinion about uh, foreign policy, George Washington, not as an official member of the Supreme Court, but I guess there's a little gray area there. But he's following up on this essential principle of ratification, 
uh, founding principle of the revolution that led to the drafting of the Constitution, that you have to separate these powers of war and peace and uh, have to have a proper constitutional declaration of war as well. And then he also did a lot of work regarding the Constitution. He was very influential, of course. He was a writer in The Federalist, but he also wrote another paper called A Citizen of New York in 1788, encouraging the people of New York to ratify. And here's how he put it. He sounds kind of like a Tenth Amendment guy today. The Constitution only serves to point out that part of the people's business which they th think proper by it to refer to the management of the person's therein designated. And he goes a little further. Those persons are to receive that business to manage, not for themselves and as their own, but as agents and overseers for the people to whom they are constantly responsible and by whom only they are to be appointed. There's so much in just that one statement that makes up the founding principles of the Revolution and of the Constitution written in 1788 by John Jay. If you think about it, the Constitution only serves to point out that part of the people's business. He's recognizing that the top of the food chain are the people themselves. We heard from many people, George Mason, Mercy Otis Warren, uh, Robert Livingston and others, that all power flows from the people. Power is from the people. It's not power to the people. It's power from the people. And the Constitution is a delegation of power from the people to the government. The government is only exercised to do what the people say you can do, and it's not for their own gain, <laughs> which is totally opposite of how it is today. But it's, the, it's about sovereignty, final authority. I know I mention this all the time, but John Adams in later years referred to the beginning of the controversy between the colonies and Great Britain as beginning in 1761 with the great speech of James Otis Jr. against the writs of assistance. Again, 1761, where he noted that an act against the Constitution is void. This is recognizing that the government doesn't determine the limits of its own power under a Constitution given to it, whether it was a written constitution, like we have for the Constitution for the United States or the Articles of Confederation, or was the unwritten British Constitution. So an act against the Constitution is void, and the Constitution is something from the people. It's an act of the people, as Thomas Paine once put it, not an act of government. So he's talking about final authority and sovereignty and government being a servant. Unfortunately, we the people have not treated things like that for many, many, many generations, probably almost from right from day one. But anyways, here again in that same paper, A Citizen of New York in 1788, he reminds us, and now, if you take it out of context, it sounds probably a little bit more awesome than it is, but I think it's a great quote. Let's just isolate it. Remember that a power to do good always involves a power to do harm. And that's so important for us to understand because so many people want government to do stuff, to stop other people from doing things they don't like, whether it's a personal choice or whatever it may be, or they want to force their way on everybody with government. But they only think short term. They look at the people in power. They look at the people in office and say, well, this person is going to force their way with this executive order, for example, not thinking about how, well, the next dude that comes in is going to have that same power. We're establishing a new precedent. John Dickinson, in response to the Stamp Act, of course, said it established if you comply with it, if you follow along, you will authorize them to do this kind of stuff. You authorize to do this. You establish the detestable precedent. As soon as you establish a precedent to do one thing, they can do more and more and more. So John Jay reminds us that if you give them the power to do something you like, you're also giving someone in the future the power to do the exact opposite. Now, he was in context. He was basically saying, OK, we can't just not give them power to do anything. We got to do something here. He was certainly one of the people who was arguing in favor of a far more uh, powerful general government in compared to the Articles of Confederation. Very few people were totally against changes. But even if we were saying John Jay was a big government guy at the time, along with Governor Morris and James Madison, for example, in comparison to what we have today, these guys were... There's no comparison whatsoever. So he was basically saying you can't just 
Uh, just because they can do something bad with every power we give them, that doesn't mean we shouldn't give them any power to do stuff that we want them to do. We have to have other responsibilities to take care that things are faithfully executed. And I know I'm mentioning some other founders other than uh, John Jay, but of course, John Dickinson, once again, around the same time as this paper came out, this is uh, Dickinson wrote it in April of 1788, Fabius number four. He told us that keeping the government within the bounds of the Constitution was up to the supreme sovereignty of the people. Again, power flows from the people, and it is the people's duty to watch and their right to take care, Dickinson put it, that the Constitution be preserved, or as he wrote in the Roman phrase, on perilous occasions to ensure that the Republic receive no damage. So you want to also always be cautious of power you authorize or beg for the government to have to do things you like, to stop some social ill, for example, to protect people, because people in the future will also have that power. So you can't think short term. And I think that's an important reminder as well. And here from the Supreme Court Historical Society, this is really interesting, and I didn't realize this. That I mean, I know he he stepped down at some point. So he served for five-ish years, almost six. He resigned from the Supreme Court on June 29th, 1795. Oliver Ellsworth, I think, maybe there was someone else in between, but Oliver Ellsworth was Chief Justice shortly after. But John Jay declined a second appointment as Chief Justice in 1800. He was actually confirmed by the Senate for another term as Chief Justice after he retired. He declined the position, just retired to his farm, I think, in Westchester County. But then in response, instead of having John Jay as the, the great Chief Justice in the Jefferson years, President John Adams, just at the end of his term, then nominated John Marshall for the position. And John Jay died on May 17, 1829 at the age of 83. It's interesting to think of how things, I'm not saying that John Jay wouldn't have taken positions very similar to Marshall and like McCulloch versus Maryland or things like that, uh, Gibbons v. Ogden. Who knows how different things would have been, but he certainly had, I think, I think he was a little more sound on limited delegated powers than Marshall was, and things could have been far different. But of course, that should also be a lesson for us as well. If we're just relying on a certain individual to be in office, to do the right thing, or a certain person to be as the chief justice of the Supreme Court. This is not the action of a free people, because as Thomas Jefferson told us, a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as a gift of their chief magistrate or of their Supreme Court or of their Congress. It is up to the people to exercise their rights, whether the government wants them to or not, and relying on individuals to do the right thing, as Patrick Henry later warned as well. Well, not later, I guess earlier in comparison, 1788 in the ratification debates. He says, if you rely on your rulers to be good men, you'll always have a consequent loss of liberty. Well, let me take a look over in the live chat and see if there's any comments or questions and uh, anything I can get back to. R.C. Andrews, good to see you, buddy. If the government is not limited, freedom will no longer exist. And that's so essential because uh, a government without limits, as Samuel Adams put it, is a tyranny, the very definition of a tyranny. The founding generation referred to this as an arbitrary government. Arbitrary because you just never know what it's going to be able to do. It can change the limits of its own power. A living, breathing constitution, in, this, in essence, is an arbitrary government. And that's one of the grievances in the Declaration of Independence. And yet, so many people today prefer a living, breathing constitution. They're actually in favor of what the Declaration of Independence was against. So that's a really good point. Good to see you, RC. Hope you're doing well. Lots of comments uh, from Time is Zero. They are not officials. They are servants. We would, of course, they need to be treated like that. But unfortunately, the people treat them as rulers, not as officials or servants. And that's why things keep getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, White Bearded New has a great quote. I know this is from uh, Jefferson. I don't see part two, but you seem to consider the judges as the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. This is a letter in the 1800s, a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. And that's kind of getting back to what I was talking about here right at the end, that Jay didn't get nominated, or he, well, he got a, uh, approved. He was confirmed by the Senate for another term uh, for eight 
1800 and on, but he said, no, thanks. We ended up with John Marshall and maybe things are far worse because of it. But I think no matter who is in there, unless we start thinking of the people as the final sovereignty, the final authority, and the people are in favor of liberty, you got to have both, things uh, will not turn around. The largest government in history will continue getting larger and larger and larger. Sharon Patriot, good to see you. Thank you for this excellent insight, Michael. I'm just grateful for the opportunity, of course, to share the words and wisdom of John Jay and many others. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. That's more important than anything. I hope you learned something. I really appreciate you being here. Of course, we want to get this kind of information out to more and more people every day and nothing helps us get that job done more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us. Don't feel any pressure, but a little bit. We could absolutely use your help. It starts out as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. And if you're not able to financial, financially contribute or you already have, there are a few other ways that you can help us spread the word. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Smash the like button on any of the video platforms. Comments. Uh, sharing links, all that stuff will help trigger algorithms and tell these platforms to show us to more people. It helps out a great deal. Again, I appreciate you being here. I hope you're having a great day so far, and I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.